Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're going to love today's episode, and it's worth listening through all the way to the end because you'll hear about all sorts of things, signals coming from your body that you can use to know what's going on. It's, it's actually a way to use your biology to drive self-awareness. Uh, so throughout the whole interview, there's just tidbits sprinkled in about what can happen. And, and we, we talk about some new tech, but behind that, there's all uh, just a wealth of knowledge here. And I had a great time in this interview with one of the companies I respect uh, most in the field of monitoring the human body. So enjoy the show. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day has to do with timing. There's a recent study where scientists found out that, especially for women, timing is everything for intense workouts. Women, not men, who performed high-frequency leg resistance training five times a week during the first two weeks of their cycle showed significant results. They had increased jump height, higher peak torque values in their hamstrings, increased lean body mass of the legs, and who doesn't want good legs, and overall positive experiences post-training. In other words, they didn't hate their life after they trained. But when they did the training during the last two weeks of their cycle, none of those results happened. So one thing you could say is, well, hey, maybe you should just work out half as much during the right time and get the same results. I, I'm just saying, so as a strategically lazy person who wants to get the most return on the investment of time and energy in everything I do, in that if I can do it less uh, and get more return in, in, as measured in physical results or just in terms of joy, <laughs> I don't actually get joy from heavy leg lifts and you probably don't either. So think about that. Maybe when you're doing the training really matters, you might even run your own little personal experiment there and realize you might wanna take it easy or do a different kind of training, a more detox, more stretching and things like that during different times of the month. I have not seen any formal recommendations from any exercise people out there about this, but I bet there's really, really interesting experiments to be done. So if you do this uh, and you notice a difference, I would love it if you just shared with me on Facebook <laughs> because this is sort of a, uh, an idea that's come to mind that's, hey, maybe we should talk about this. Before we get into the show today, you probably don't know about Bulletproof Cacao Butter. And yes, if you're watching on YouTube, I'm holding up a bag of this in a shameless way of promotion here. And the Bulletproof Cacao Butter comes from chocolate, but it doesn't have the dark stuff in chocolate. It's just pure chocolate fat, which melts almost at exactly your body temperature. And what I do with the cacao butter is I put just a teaspoon or two in my Bulletproof coffee along with the normal grass-fed butter and the brain octane oil and the special beans. And what happens is instead of a strong coffee finish, you taste the coffee and then at the very end, you get this amazing chocolate flavor that's very different than you would have if you were drinking a mocha, which is kind of an overpowering chocolate flavor, even though I like a mocha as well. It turns out all chocolate is produced by fermentation and about 80% of South American chocolate sampled recently had mold contamination. It's a jungle product that's dried in a moist environment. And these are not studies that I funded or made up. This is an, a known problem in agriculture, which is why they have different standards in different countries. And 64% of the microbes that create chocolate create toxins that are called mycotoxins or mold toxins. And even at levels that are approved safe, they can make you tired, they can make you jittery, they can give you headaches. And what's going on here is they're saying, well, you're, we're going to assume you're having X amount of toxins per day. So this is safe because you won't eat very much chocolate. But bottom line is we're lab testing our chocolate to make sure that you're getting some clean chocolate. And there's a difference in the cacao butter. So you'll like how you feel after you use this. You can also make truffles and other dessert-like things with it. So it's one of those things I don't talk about it very much, but I absolutely adore it as a chef and as a, a culinary guy, you can do just cool stuff with it. So that's called Upgraded Cacao Butter at Bulletproof.com and it's a fun hack for desserts and your Bulletproof coffee. All right, let's get going. Today's guest is a huge challenge for me because I am going to attempt to say a name in Finnish. Are you guys ready? His name is, here we go, I'm going to say this right, Petri Latella. Petri, how'd I do? Yes, very well. Awesome. All right, there. Now I can claim that I speak Finnish, right? Okay, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Finnish names are uh, hard. Uh, Petri is the CEO and co-founder of Aura Health. And he's a serial entrepreneur with 25 years of experience. And if you don't know about Aura, you might have seen me in a few different uh, venues wearing a kind of cool looking ring. 
If you are watching on YouTube, you can go to bulletproof.com slash YouTube and just get a link to the channel if you want to see this, but most people are, are driving. Um, I'm wearing this kind of cool, uh, I don't even know what kind of metal it looks like, like a shiny black metal ring thing. Uh, my first episode of on the Dr. Oz show, I was wearing this and a uh, 24-hour blood glucose sensor, so it was kind of my bionic arm because embedded in this ring is a bunch of trackers, like, like the track movement and respiration and temperature and things like that. I'm really interested in having Petreon to talk about monitoring yourself. And the reason I think that you'll care about this is that when you can get a little bit more data, particularly around sleep quality, it totally tells you whether what you're doing works. I've tracked my sleep for almost 10 years now on a nightly basis. I can tell you for the past five years now, I've had six hours and five minutes of sleep per night on average. How do I know that? Because I do it. I can tell you when I put on my true dark glasses and wear them for a while before bed, I double my deep sleep on not every night, but on many nights if I do the other stuff right. When I stack it with sleep mode, it works even better. Sleep mode's the bulletproof supplement. I can also tell you, like if I have caffeine later in the day, I can see it. I still sleep, but my sleep quality changes. So I want you guys to, to understand that. And a lot of people also don't know this. I was CTO of Basis, the wristband company that Intel bought for $100 million, which was the first company to get heart rate off the wrist even before the Apple Watch did that. So I have like a deep knowledge here and I wanted to share with you an interview with Petri, who really knows a lot about what's going on here, and to suggest that if you're going to do monitoring and tracking, we're gonna talk about what's useful, what's not useful that is tracked commonly in the industry, and how you could potentially incorporate either this kind of technology or something similar into your lifestyle, and how it can, with very little work on your part, give you something meaningful. So welcome to the show, Petri. Thank you very much. Very nice introduction. It's honor. It's All honor right. to to be here with you today. Oh, thank you, and I appreciate that you're uh, dialing in on this call from uh, from Finland. And so for me, it's morning, but for you, it's evening. Yeah, that's right. If we would follow our chronotypes, I think it should be opposite. So you you have it, it oh, me are, in the evening and I in the morning. So. <laughs> Are you one of those disgusting morning people? <laughs> I'm a lion. Yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm a lion. Yes. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so what we're talking about, if, if you heard the interview with Dr. Michael Bruce, yes. uh, who wrote The Power of When, there's four, four chronotypes, and 15% of us are morning people, uh, like Petri, and 15%, and those are called lions, 15% of people like me are night people called wolves, and about roughly half of people are bears during the normal time, and 15% of people never sleep very well. And those are the people, by the way, if you're one of those where you, you always wake up every night, there's hacks for that, and I've written a lot of them. In fact, a lot of the bulletproof hacks have been like replicated on hundreds of health sites now. Um, but if you wanna know what's going on, having a tracker is the number one way to know what's going on, which is why it's cool that you mentioned that. Uh, and I, I just have to say, you know, we've all heard that the early bird catches the worm, uh, that, that, that common mm -hmm. aphorism, but the second part of that never gets repeated, and it's that the early bird works for the late bird. I'm just saying. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so there is no moral superiority from waking up early or waking up late. Yeah. It's just about your chronotype, exactly. right? And that's, uh, that's a cool thing. Yeah. All right, so let's get back to this cool tracking stuff. Your 25-year experience, uh, health entrepreneur, you've done tracking stuff before. Now, one of the reasons I joined Basis is that it was the first technology, this was you know, back when, at the time when Fitbit was a tiny company, we were competing with them. Uh, I joined them because it was the first and only tech, this is going back, geez, almost 10 years, uh, that could get heart rate variability from the wrist uh, while you were moving around. It was, it was really cool stuff. And now, like the world has changed, sensors are better, and I don't like bracelets that much, although actually I'm wearing a bracelet today, but it's not heavy and doesn't require charging. So the, the thing I've got on my, my hand right now, the Aura Ring, can track a bunch of stuff. What are all the things that you can track from one finger now? Yeah, so first of all, we access the arteries. On every, every finger, we have two arteries on the palm side of the finger, and with the ring, we access directly uh, the arteries so so we get really accurate reading not only of your heart rate but the pulse pulse waveform and the 
interbeat interval time between the heartbeats as well as the pulse amplitude variation so all the characteristics of the pulse waveform and and there's lots of information about your physiology even about your biology inside there and it tells about your autonomic nervous system balance and and also how it's working together with your central nervous system so how your brain and, and heart are talking to each other so there are plenty of very interesting information in different timelines of the of, um, collecting the data it it's interesting that you can tell how someone's breathing, how often they're breathing, just from looking at their heartbeat. And a lot of people just don't know that. So there's this wealth of knowledge that comes from just like what's going on here. And you might know this, who, or what's the first tradition that noticed this? Um, so yeah, it has been known for quite some time that of course from the timing, the time between the heartbeats, you can calculate your respiration rate, but also uh, from from the variation of the uh, pulse wave itself, you can actually see the breathing uh, frequency as well and the variation of the frequency. So especially when you do, you have the you you have the visualization of the pulse waveform, and you do, for example, deep breathing exercise, you can see very well that how how the pulse amplitude is variating along with your breathing rate. So there are two different ways to de derive uh, the breathing and, and breathing frequency and, and the respiration rate. It's, it's kind of funny. Cardiologists figured this out, you know, probably going back over the last 60, 70 years, and they started looking at this stuff when we could first get reliable pulse stuff, and they started looking at correlative analysis. But if you go back thousands of years, traditional Chinese medicine, uh, traditional uh, Tibetan medicine, which is a different form of medicine that's a little bit more linked to Ayurveda, and Ayurvedic uh, physicians, they would all touch your, your wrist in different places, and an experienced practitioner would have all these algorithms in their nervous system. So they could touch your finger, or sorry, touch your wrist for about eight seconds, and not just get beats per minute. Any doctor who regularly takes a pulse can do that. Like they, they just know, like an ER doctor can, it's, it's like the magic power. But these guys, and I did this in Tibet, it like touches four points on the wrist and it's like, okay, and it tells you all sorts of stuff. And what's going on here with the aura ring is something roughly similar to that, probably not as nuanced as two nervous systems interacting, but you're getting this wealth of data that is not intuitively obvious uh, to, uh, to almost anyone, uh, it, even if you're a medical professional, you wouldn't think it's there, but when you do the crunching. Um, how did you fit all this stuff in a ring, though? I, I mean, I got to say, that, uh, uh, having worked in the space, I was kind of impressed that it's still a bit bulky. I, mm. I would like it to be half as big, mm. and I get a, a tan line I don't like from my ring. I, I've never worn rings, but it's less annoying than wearing like a heavy bracelet. Mm. Uh, so how did you get all that stuff in there? Like how how... Give me the story. Yeah, so when we started, it was impossible to fit everything in. So 2012, 2013, at that time, even, even the processor with all the necessary functions was too big to fit in. But fortunately, the technology and uh, everything started to develop uh, along with, with our designs. And the first prototypes were huge. Uh, so <laughs> kind of boxes and so on. <laughs> oh, I yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, but eventually uh, playing with the varying comfort and and different kind of aspects of anatomy and and combining all those to the beautiful Scandinavian design, eventually we could fit in. Of course, the battery takes the biggest biggest part here, yeah. and and uh, the electronics can be fit quite nicely to a smaller form factor already, but the battery technology it hasn't been developing so well uh, during the recent years but i hope that there will be some quantum leaps there as well in future well i i'm looking forward to the day when it it's as thin as a normal uh, like decorative mm -hmm. ring but you've got a battery and the sensors in there yes um, because it it really matters 
Uh, I'm also looking forward to the day when the charging system is the same size as the ring. Because mm, yeah, <laughs> right yes. now when I travel, yes. uh, when I travel with the ring, the charger is like six times bigger yeah. than the ring. Yeah. I'm like, I don't want to put that in my luggage. Yes. Uh, but these are minor things that will change over time. Yeah. And right now, just kind of from memory, I know that the sleep tracking is something I've got a lot of value from. Uh, I use the microphone on my iPhone when my phone's in airplane mode. Uh, to, to get a rough sense of my sleep quality, but this is much more accurate. You're getting heart rate, heart rate variability, which is something since the beginning of Bulletproof, I've talked about training your heart rate variability as a form of feedback. Uh, usually using the heart math stuff uh, has been really powerful. Uh, so this doesn't do training, but it tells you essentially how, how much you're in a stressed or an unstressed mode. Uh, activity, like number of steps, and I wanna ask you a lot about that. Your body temperature, which is super cool, uh, and then how much you're, you're, uh, you're breathing and things like that. Now, I, I want to kind of go through each of those. Like, all right, why would someone listening care about getting this stuff? So you're getting heart rate variability reports from just wearing a ring and they show up on your phone. What, what does that tell you? What, what can you get from heart rate variability this way? Yeah, so first of all, something about heart rate variability. Of course, you know a lot about it, but uh, for listeners that, someone who, who doesn't is, is not so familiar with that heart rate variation is, is something that it, it's so sensitive a parameter that basically everything in your life affects that so it's it's really important to know the context when you can measure it and and so that you are not affecting subjectively or or with some stimulants uh, to the actual reading so our perspective is that the most valid time to measure your heart rate variation is during the night. So when you when yeah. you sleep. So this so the ring calculates HRV for each five minute period. So it measures every beat and the time between the heartbeats and it calculates over the five minutes periods. Uh, it, it calculates the heart rate variability and then it shows that um, average value there uh, in the app in the cloud api cloud, cloud ui you see actually the whole curve over the night but through through that and as, especially as a trend of so how how your heart rate variation is is varying over the time that's really important information like along in, in relation to your sleeping patterns, how they change over the time. So it tells you the direction that how, how your uh, autonomic nervous system is tackling with, with stress, different stressors in your life, mental and physical stressors, whatever, it's always a combination of those. So you can, you can get a good that, indication that, that where are you are heading, heading to. That's something that that so many people have never been taught in school or in the gym. It, it's that stress is not good or bad, but stress is stress. And there's psychological and emotional and environmental stress. And then exercise is stress, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you're under a ton of stress because you know you were just in a in a hurricane and your house was flooded, which is happening to a lot of people right now. Uh, or, or maybe you know you're you're displaced for a little while, and this actually has happened to me, and, and it's terribly stressful. Or you just broke up with someone. Maybe that's not the time to go hit the gym really hard and do a, a full day of intermittent fasting, mm. <laughs> followed by a, a fasted heavy workout. Mm. Uh, and you may not know that, especially because you're stressed already, so you're not thinking as clearly. But if your data says uh, today is not a heavy workout day, the heart rate variability is going to tell you that. And if today you're like, you know, you should hit it really hard because you're in a good place, you can apply the stress to become hormetic. Uh, hormesis is the idea: what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. And not everything is hormetic. You know, cyanide mm. <laughs> in small doses mm. doesn't make you stronger. It just mm. ruins your mitochondria, yes. right? Yes. So you can use the aura ring to tell you when you should apply stress that makes you stronger because you have less of the stress that makes you weak. Is, is, mm. that, a, is that a good way of explaining it? Yeah, definitely. So this is really important in, in relation to stress because many people have kind of negative annotation to, to stress. And definitely it's not negative. We always need some stress to perform at our best. So 
Usain Bolt, when he's on the starting line of 100 meters, if you would measure, he is in high stress situation. But the, the effect is that you get the best out of yourself that way. So, so that's why basically we don't talk about stress because uh, many people have, have negative association to, to stress. So we, we have turned the coin upside down and talk about readiness. And, and so, so through the HRV as one of the parameters, you can see what is a good day, good day to, to stretch your limits and, and really push forward? And what are the days to take it easy? So that, that's why you would care about heart rate variability because it's going to tell you how much unconscious stress is my body under? And then you might decide, all right, I'm gonna figure out what this is. Maybe you have a chronic low-grade infection, which is a common source of stress. And if your body's always stressed and you're not exercising, like, all right, I have work to do here. Because what that means is that I'm doing something, or even better yet, something is happening that I'm not doing that's making me weak. And it could be something in your environment. If you're sleeping on top of your Wi-Fi router and it's turned on, that's actually going to change your heart rate mm. variability. It's gonna show that your body was stressed. Mm. Like, oh wow, yeah. I, I gotta figure out what it is. And, and you may not know what it is, but okay, knowing there's a problem, now you can start the hacking process. And when you stop doing the things that make you weak, it's much easier to do that than just, I'm just gonna get stronger. Mm. Because if you're the strongest man in the world, but you're, you're carrying a huge burden of useless crap mm. with you, you're still weak because the amount of free energy left after you do all the weak stuff isn't very high. Whereas if you're the strongest person in the world and you do nothing that makes you weak, you have this infinite, enormous, like untapped capacity. And a lot of biohacking is around that algorithm. In fact, that's the core thing behind the Bulletproof Diet. It is like, look, stop the stuff that makes you weak. Heart rate variability tells you if something's making you weak. That's why I'm such a fan of getting that signal. And until now, it was always sleep with a chest strap on. Like, mm. like one of those cardio monitoring chest mm. straps, which is just terribly, like no one's ever gonna mm. do that unless they're seriously into this stuff. Mm. All right, nightly temperature is another thing that I've been fascinated with forever. Talk with me about why tracking your temperature changes at night would be important. Yeah, it's so temperature, as you said, is really interesting parameter. So especially during the night, like basically all the, kind of five signals we make we get during the night they reflect what's happening in our life during the day so our body is is giving it its response but in relation to temperature um, it is inside our biology that actually human body reaches the lowest body temperature during the night all of us humans we are around a few hours of window around 4.30 a.m. when we reach the lowest body temperature. And with the ring, we actually get about 0.07 degrees centigrade resolution of your body temperature reading and the variation during the night. So we can really accurately detect uh, what's the lowest uh, body temperature for each night. And then we, as a trend, we show you how it's variating between the nights. Now, I'm putting on my, my hat for when I was at Basis. We were also looking at tracking body temperature. There's just one problem, and I could do this because I'm wearing the ring on my middle finger, so I get to like show off my middle finger, <laughs> which I haven't really done on Bill the Critter. But uh, when, uh, uh, when you're looking at a finger or a wrist, this is not near the core, and you're supposed to like suck on something, get a rectal temperature or maybe an armpit temperature, for full accuracy. And some people get cold hands, especially when they sleep. How are you able to track temperature from a finger? Yeah, actually, um, as you know, when you go to sleep, the core temperature is pushed to the periphery. So, so uh, that's, that's what happens. It's a biological thing that needs to happen when we go to sleep. Yeah. And then you're... you're ha In fact, you... You can't go to sleep with cold feet and exactly. cold hands. Your body won't let you. Exactly. Right? Most people don't know yes. that. So if your hands are really cold and warm, you have to warm exactly. them up. That's why blankets are helpful yes. or a warm bath. Yes. So there exactly. you go. So thanks for yes. saying that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so that's that's one of the things that has to happen so that you can you can get to sleep. And and there's quite a high rise of temperature when you go to sleep, when you just lay down and you're prepared 
for sleep. If there's enough melatonin, the hormonal balance is for for sleep. So then, then uh, the skin temperature starts to reflect the body temperature, and then then they start to get closer to each other. And then when you reach the lowest body temperature, then the skin temperature is the same as the body temperature. So so that happens during the night, and uh, so. Um, that's one thing, and that's actually the, one of the basic things for detecting your chronotype. So the Aura Ring is, is the, basically it's, it's the only product in the market that can detect your real chronotype and then reflect back to you. It, that's not in the report, no, is it? No, it's not there yet because it, you know, it took quite a while for us to, to get enough data. Uh, from, we have now customers in more than 50 countries. And for the last couple of years, we've been learning a lot through that data, that how unique <laughs> we all are. And, and we have digged deeper into the data. And now we, we validate it. We, we can see, we can detect those chronotypes that Dr. Preus is, is talking about. And, and we can dig deeper into your personality, your biology. And for those who, who, don't, who are not so familiar with chronotype, it's so deep in the in, in our biology as, as fingerprint or skin color. It's, it's very, very deep there. And it, it is possible to force yourself to wake up early. For two years, I woke up at 5 a.m. every morning. My chronotype says I should wake up at 8.45 or 9. And I, I, I wrote Headstrong basically between 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. under red lighting using true dark glasses and stuff like that so I didn't break my, my uh, biorhythms. But that's when all the good stuff happens in my brain. And it's been that way since I was a kid. Mm. It's, that's just how I am. And I would sort of beat myself up, say, oh, I, I should just wake up <laughs> early. And, and no, it's, it's like, we're different, exactly. right? Like, like there's, neither is good or yes. bad. But what has me most excited about Aura and, and just this whole era that we're, we're coming across, uh, when you think about it, you now have more data about this stuff than probably, I don't want to say any other company because there's some other fitness trackers, but they don't have the resolution yes. of data that you yes. have. And you can apply machine learning mm -hmm. to this and, and get stuff about chronotype that no one's ever yes. known. So that's always been happening, mm. stuff that a few doctors like Dr. Bruce mm. or uh, others out there for a whole bunch of mm. things, they've been saying this forever, mm. but not enough data to just be like, all right, we didn't have to do a double blind mm. clinical trial. We just have data from a million yes. people. And you have machine learning mm. that'll tease this mm. out. Going way back in the early days of big mm. data, um, I, was, I was actually an angel investor in what's arguably the first big data company. It was a company called Atomark mm. that was doing like, like semi-structured mm. data and all this. Yeah. And we didn't have machine learning back mm. then. And now though, it's, it's almost painless. And you look at other companies doing stuff like this, uh, Viome, mm. uh, Naveen yeah. Jain has been on, on Bulletproof Radio, uh, a good friend. And I'm an advisor to Viome now. And these guys are doing something similar where they're gathering data about all of the weird stuff growing like in, in your body, mm. like, like fungus mm. and virus and bacteria in, in your gut and correlating that stuff with a data set that's unparalleled because mm. no one's ever gotten all that yeah. data at all, much less mixed yeah. it along with knowledge about behaviors yes. and things. So there's this huge wave of knowledge and you're doing this for sleep and for, for stress and recovery. Mm. And it's that that has me just like, like this is world changing mm. stuff. And even uh, 40 Years of Zen, mm. which is uh, one of my other portfolio companies, the, one, the stuff that does uh, high-end, high-performance executive mm. uh, neurofeedback, we're getting these brain states from like world-leading uh, uh, meditators mm. and, and gurus and CEOs of people mm. and looking with machine learning at patterns in their yeah. brains uh, so that we, like, what are the things that high performers actually mm. do? And no one's ever done exactly. that. And, and so it's happening across every field, but you guys, I think, are the leader right now because of your form mm. factor. Mm. Yes. What else? What else are you going to tell us from all this big data? Like, what else is, is on your horizon for cool stuff besides? Yeah. So our target is to really get to personalized uh, guidance, so that we really get deep into your biology and physiology, so that we can reflect with the product. We can reflect back to you how you are doing and how you can help yourself. So that's our passion, really, to have a product or have a have a solution that you can self-reflect and become more self-aware what's happening in your body when in relation to your lifestyle 
So whatever you do in your life, how your body is responding to that and be kind of a best validation tool for you to allow, explore different kind of things and then see what's your, what's the response of, from your body? Because we are all unique and, and we really respect this uniqueness and we want to bring it back to people. So kind of people can start respecting their uniqueness Chronotype is one thing, but as, as in your company, you are, you are respecting the uniqueness of all your employees, uh, having their characteristics. Uh, I don't remember what, what kind of name you used for that, but anyhow, you have the, your chronotypes and, and so on. Yeah, oh, yeah. We, we get uh, the Colby yeah, score, yeah, exactly. uh, which, which shows your, your instincts for uh, you know, how much data yes. you need to make a decision. And we yeah. share this. Everyone knows everyone else's chronotypes and, and our love language. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, it's kind of ridiculous, but it really helps you interact because yes. these are deep wiring exactly. things. Exactly. And also that the people have different response to stress. And of course, life mm -hmm. situations change all the time. And the rest tr stress response in our body, let's say our dynamics and capacity vary over the time in depend, depending on the life situations uh, so so we want our users to be aware of those things and then look forward uh, that, that okay i'm aware of what's happening in my body right now so i know what kind of small things i can do to to improve i would make the argument that it is a moral imperative to hack yourself which just means driving awareness and then making the changes that are painless mm to improve how you feel, how much energy you have. And I'd also argue, and this is a bit controversial, that as, a, as an entrepreneur, as an employer, ethical and moral to hack your employees. Mm. So anything I can do in the environment that, like we're opening a new headquarters in Seattle soon, and so I just spent a bunch of time with our lighting engineer to have mm. the most biologically compatible yeah. lighting possible. And it's directly affecting the biology of the yes. people who support the Bulletproof yes. mission. So, I feel obligated to do the very best I can. Yes. And there's no diet soda. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I don't care if someone wants to drink exactly. it. I'm not paying for exactly. it. All right, like stuff like that. Exactly. Like, how could we not all be doing yes. this because we care about exactly. each other? Like it, it, but yes. all right, flip side of that. Mm. Now, let's say that I'm, you know, I, I'm a big bad uh, company spraying uh, toxins mm. on our soil and our crops. Mm. Uh, we're talking about glyphosate mm. here. Now, if I got all my employees to wear the aura mm. ring and I required that they sent their data to mm. me so I could track mm. you know, it, is there like a downside to having all this data? Are you worried about privacy issues or because you're in Scandinavia where they actually value privacy? You yes, about? actually, yeah, we value privacy a lot. And, and we want always that the user is, is owning the data and also consenting the access to the data to those let's say those people or those coaches or doctors that they, they want to themselves. But we, we never want to, we don't want to go to that kind of arena that uh, your data would be mis mishandled by someone to, so for, yeah, to read something, I don't know, even, yeah. I, I, well, it, it's, the, the idea is it's your exactly. data. And, and this is something... Uh, when you're listening right now, it's really worth thinking about another paradigm shift, and Aura is, is on top of this. All of your data about your biology, including your medical lab tests, it's your data. It's not your doctor's yes. data. And the traditional uh, uh, patriarchal, just kind of evil perspective has been you have to go to your doctor, get a permission slip to know about what's going on in your body. The doctor gets the data and decides if you get to mm. see it, and they get a copy, and they can do whatever they want mm. with it. Not okay. Yeah. I keep mentioning Viome because uh, they they did the same thing you're doing, where they're getting data about what's growing in your body, and they give it to you mm. on the webpage, mm. and they will not give it to your mm. doctor. You actually have to choose to share it with your exactly. doctor with the share exactly. button, which is completely like a middle finger mm. to the entire yes. paradigm that we've had yes. before. And I, I love it that you're honoring the fact that our data is mm. ours. And, and this is something for everyone listening here, anytime you're gathering this data, if you're going to get a life insurance policy, if you're going to get a health insurance policy, uh, or any other thing like that, you should be allowed to disclose or not disclose this mm. stuff uh, as you choose. Yes. It is not supposed to be a part of your permanent yes. record. 
and the whole electronic medical records thing is BS. Mm. And thankfully, what you're collecting is not officially medical mm. data. Yes. Now, now we were talking about temperature, and you didn't mention because it's medical two mm. things, but I can mention them because mm. I don't work for Aura mm. and I don't have any <laughs> business relationship with yes. them. Yes. Which, which is awesome, yeah. right? And and by the way, uh, this is something else you should know as a listener of Bulletproof Radio. There are, depending on what country you're in, there are laws, and they're different, that prevent you from having free speech. It's literally called, in the US, controlled speech. I'm not, you can't even make this stuff up. So I'm not allowed to tell you what my products do if they affect a medical condition. Mm. And in fact, it's illegal to say that any saturated fat, including ones that have a thousand studies to say they're good for it, it's illegal mm. to say that they're healthy mm. because the definition of healthy means low. Yeah. So what that means is that if you can diagnose medical conditions with the data coming off the ring, the second you say you're diagnosing a medical condition, you become a medical device and you have to charge 10 times more for it mm. and have all these studies. Yes. And so by, by making the data owned by a person and allowing the person to apply algorithms, uh, you're, you're kind of cutting out the middleman mm. here and, and kudos to you for yes. doing that. So, so here's the two things that I'm going mm. to say that you may or may not be able to mm. say. Um, if you wink with your, left, <laughs> with your left eye, that means yes, but I'm kidding. So one of the things that is profoundly important that was in my own life is thyroid problems, especially Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Mm. Um, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's when I was 26, going back um, like 18 years or something. Mm. And uh, you will see a subclinical thyroid condition where they say, oh, your, your lab tests are normal. It doesn't matter if you're fat and tired mm. all the time and your eyebrows are falling out. <laughs> I, in my eyebrows, I, I don't have the outer part of them because I had a thyroid mm. for a long time, mm. thyroid problems. All that stuff, you can see it from nighttime temperature yes. variation. So if your lab tests are, are within normal mm. but low, but you have symptoms, and your temperature is off, it's time to start looking at removing the things that are causing a thyroid problem. Mm. That would be whole grains and mold toxins in your environment, mm. and some other things too, but those are big triggers. Or to look at what else is going on, maybe you want to go on thyroid meds. If your temperature is chronically low, the ring's gonna tell you, and then you can go out and solve the problem, mm. but that is massively important. Mm. And see, so I think you're gonna find a lot of people with subclinical hypothyroidism. It's a rampant issue right mm. now. Uh, it's also tied to light exposure, mm. by the way. Mm. You know, if, if you're looking at bright screens at night, your thyroid can get mm. jacked from that because of your hypothalamus. Second thing was the topic of my first book called The Better Baby mm. Book, and it's fertility. Mm. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. Can you talk about what happens with your nightly temperature if you're a woman? What does it do during the time you're ovulating? Yeah, actually, yeah, we, we have validated that we can we can see and we can show the menstrual cycles. And... Um, even even detect the ovulation times. Uh, so at least it's very useful for females to see the menstrual cycles accurately there in the app, and then then they can do what you mentioned in the beginning. The female athletes, especially, they can really concentrate on those exercises that are good in in that phase of their menstrual cycle. So. I'm not that deep in the biology itself, what's happening in different phases, but it's anyhow a reflection of, of the hormonal balance that is changing, changing during the period. So females are so, let's say, beautiful creatures. We males are kind of a dull in that sense that our variation in our hormonal functions, it not, it's not that interesting or it's, it's not that big uh, like, like females. So they are beautiful creatures in that sense that that is needed for for fertility and and uh, for many other things kind of a, what it can reflect and, and in relation to your sleep and readiness how your menstrual cycles are affecting them so there are plenty of different kind of insights that you can derive from that for for a long time I've I've believed just from observation, women are much better biohackers than men. Mm, yes. <laughs> because the, the self-awareness uh, that's a part of understanding, wait, something just shifted? Because women experience more shifts than men, they tend to be more aware yes. of them. And every woman out there can learn, oh, I'm about to ovulate. Mm. And a lot of them know it, but a lot of them don't know it because they've never learned, oh, you know, here's the changes in my body that happen you know, five days before, four days, three days. Okay, I'm probably in my ovulation window now in the next day or two, mm. and then I'll be fertile for a couple days yeah. after. 
you go back 50 or 100 years, pretty much most women learned this because it was the only reliable method of birth mm. control was, well, when I'm fertile, you know, don't have sex. Mm. There was an interesting podcast recently uh, where we talked about uh, post-birth control pills syndrome. Mm. And it turns out if you're on the birth control pill, you'll see changes in the fluctuation of your temperature. But if you choose to go off the pill, and I would tell you, if you want to lower your risks of cancer, like the, the pill is not a longevity strategy that's very effective for women. Like it, it comes at a greater health cost later in life that isn't well disclosed. So if you decided you wanted to allow your body's hormonal rhythms to work, but you wanted to know the time when you would be most fertile so you can have a child if you're looking to, or the time you're most fertile to not have a child when you don't want to, your temperature fluctuations from a ring can actually show you when that's happening. So then you can be like, oh, this is what it feels like when I'm about to ovulate. And once you have that, if you're a, a woman who's clued into how her body's feeling, mm. you'll probably know without the mm. ring. But it's that really cool signal, like, I, I think I've got this. Now I've got the data to show me I've got this. Now I can put this feeling together with this biological mm. state. That's what it is. And then you've got yes. it. And that's precious stuff. Yes, yes. All right. Let's shift gears and talk about sleep, mm. which, funny enough, also controls, well, not controls, but influences your thyroid function mm. and your fertility. Mm. Now, you have a sleep score, and, and going back to the days of Zio, mm. which was the first sleep monitor I yes. used, is this headband you'd wear, they got EEG. Yes. Uh, ben Rubin uh, is, a, is a friend who's the founder of that. And I was always annoyed because the sleep score was based on eight hours of mm. sleep. But we know people who live the longest sleep six and a mm. half hours a night, and different people need different amounts of yes. sleep depending on their stress yes. level. So I talked to Ben, and this is going back years, and I actually changed the algorithm, mm. uh, at least how to calculate it. So if I only wanted five hours of sleep, what was my sleep score for the five hours I wanted versus eight hours or 10 hours? Mm. So how do you calculate a sleep score? So when I wake up in the morning, it says, you got whatever your sleep score was. What does that actually mean? Like, what, Give me a little bit of detail. Yeah, actually, the sleep score is... is um, there are seven, at least seven different contributors that affect uh, or formulate the sleep score. So that total sleep is, is only one of them. Efficiency, disturbances, amount of REM sleep, deep sleep, and sleep latency. When you go to sleep, how quickly you fall asleep. And then sleep timing, which is a reflection to, to, to your chronotype. So how much variance there is, there is in the when you go to bed, when you wake up. So, so total sleep is only one, one factor there. Um, and and it, has, it doesn't have that big, let's say, influence to the score itself. Uh, we, we try to reflect more about the restorativeness of your sleep. So, yeah, so, so how kind of efficient sleep you get in the time that you, have, you are in the bed. So good sleep is better than more sleep that's mm. not good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and you're tracking that in the score. Yeah, yes, okay. yes. Yeah, it's a combination of, of many things. And, and uh, we know that one of the biggest questions for people is, is the amount of deep sleep and, and amount of different sleep stages. And I would say that, that the challenge in the existing research, sleep research that have, has been done so far is that it's based on, on one night in sleep lab, having all the wires on. <laughs> right. So who sleeps well in that environment? And all the specialists know that problem, but still they kind of derive generalized kind of recommendations that how much deep sleep you should, you should get, how much REM sleep you should get. But actually there is a big variation on those amounts depending on what's your life situation, what's your autonomic nervous system capacity, dynamics, what kind of things is happening in your life, how much mental stress there is, uh, what's the timing. So especially these rhythms, daily do doings, your meal times, the amounts of meals, the quality of the food you eat, and so on, your activities and light exposures, all the things they are affecting those different different sleep sleep stages and the amount of them. So there is no such a thing that for everyone we could say that you have to get twenty percent of deep sleep every night. That's not true. So and in in the, in ah, the normal th thanks for saying that <laughs> in the normal daily life context there is a big big variance on those things 
And, uh, and we need to respect again our uniqueness in that sense that we need to correlate feeling and also other body responses, not only looking at, at the sleep just by itself, but also the other body responses to see that how restorative sleep you've got. So there are many, many factors there. The other data point that I, I would love to see, and this is something that you don't need any technology to do, but if you literally have a piece of paper next to your bed with a, a row of dates on it, you can also do this on your phone if you want to be tech about it, but it's like, how do I feel when I woke exactly. up? Exactly, yes. Just that second when you wake yeah. up, like, wow, did I wake up, like, was I, was I having a really nice dream? And then I just drifted awake, or did I jolt awake, or do I wake up feeling yes. like stressed and anxious, like physically, not like I'm worrying, yes. but just like my body doesn't feel all those things hugely impactful. What did I eat last yes, night? Exactly. Like, did I stay up late watching a yeah. movie? Uh, you know, did I have a glass of wine? Mm. Those are huge things that affect exactly. that, and you'll get all the yes. data. But if you have no data, just how am I doing right now the second you wake up? It's so valuable. Exactly. But if you had a little, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how do I feel mm. uh, to tie that in with the data? I think you'd probably come up with this amazing thing that says, wow, when people have this, this, and this happen, 90% of them get a 10 out of 10 yes, when they wake up. exactly. I'm, I'm all over that. And we are, we are going to have tags and notes um, in the next versions of, of the app so that you can do oh, exactly yeah. that thing. And we collect that data to the cloud as well so that you can do your insights. You can derive your insights through that. So we can, we can start showing you this kind of cause and effect kind of the insights have, that have even, uh, let's say, longer than just 24 hours effect on your body responses. All that is, is about becoming more self-aware. So we want to enable you to learn about those things and tack those things that, that you feel kind of meaningful in that context. Uh, I'm... I'm very excited about where the world is going with applying machine learning algorithms to all this biological data from hundreds of thousands of people mm -hmm. and then finding something new and then sharing it with the world and saying, we, we have very high correlation here where we know that, th that these are correlated, then we can theorize what the cause is, but whether or not we know what the cause is, we could theorize that it's actually caused by invisible leprechaun mm -hmm. aliens. Okay. It's a theory, and all all medicine, including the causal mm. stuff, is still based on theories that will probably be evolved and disproven. Just mm. like you know, Newtonian motion, like oh, it turns out there's quantum stuff going on, but it's a good model. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter if we know what the cause mm. is. If we know do A and B will happen almost all yes. the time. What happens to an A and B? That's science, and it's awesome. Yes. In the meantime, as a biohacker, I'm just going to keep doing A because I know I get mm. B, and we'll figure out why in the mm. middle. And maybe we'll find out that there's some reason that we should change mm. it. But in the meantime, you're getting data. Just this is like a sea change for humanity. Mm. This kind of stuff. I'm really excited. That's mm. why I've I've been in quantified self for a long mm. time. And mm. it just so so kudos for this. And mm. I I want you guys to to publish regular reports. Hey, we don't know why, but we just noticed mm. this, and yes. it probably matters. Yes. So then a whole wave of academic yes. researchers can go out and do this. Yes. Like This is what's happening in the world right yes. now, and it's never happened in all of history. Yes. So it's it's a great time to be alive. Yes, and we are happy to see that lots of academy, uh, different universities are so uh, interested about these things, and, and we have lots of those universities as our collaboration partners these days. So we really wish to be able to help sleep research and and this kind of chronobiological research and, and enabling us individuals to be empowered of all those findings that that we can we can find through through that kind of work. So in, in normal daily life context, we get this kind of huge amount of valuable insights uh, of so many things. And, and then you can think about kind of finding your your kind of people those who are the same chronotype as you are and they are their demographics is, is close to you then you can start sharing with them that okay I'm doing this kind of hacks and I, I can improve my my deep sleep amount or whatever you want to improve these months and then that's that's the sharing that we would like to enable 
it's kind of funny. Uh, one hack there, the time you drink your coffee mm. is based on your chronotype. Mm. And there is a, a daily acid alkaline uh, rhythm mm. where if you, if you wake up, you're one of those people like you who wakes up mm. early in the morning, mm. bright and ready to go, you have an acid spike earlier than yes. you. And that actually gives you energy. So an acid spike is not mm. bad. It's normal. And if you don't have it, you'll feel like crap. Yes. And then after the acid gets metabolized, you get alkalinity, which gives you mm. endurance throughout yes. the day. So for you, you probably should wait an hour after you wake up to drink your cup of coffee mm. because you'll get an extra little bit of an acid spike that then will become alkaline. Mm. You'll get more endurance throughout mm. the day. Whereas someone who wakes up earlier than they really mm. should can drink their coffee right mm. away to move the acid spike earlier and to get a little bit more cortisol mm. when you want yes. it, right? And then to cause the, the alkaline, uh, as the fruit acids get metabolized, mm. they become alkaline. Mm. And so stuff like that. Well, okay, if you can identify your type of people, mm. and go, oh, hey, I shifted my coffee so I have it after mm. breakfast instead of before breakfast, mm. who would have thought? Yes. Of course, you're in Scandinavia, it's dark mm. all the time there, so you should just drink coffee 24 <laughs> 7. I believe you're in the, the highest drink, coffee drinking country on earth, exactly. but anyway, that's I true. diverge there. That's true. <laughs> so. Uh, anyway, I, I somehow brought sleep and coffee together because they go together. Yeah. But just getting the data to know what you are, to know how it should change the habits of your day, I, I just find that to be some of the coolest stuff we could ever do. Because for everyone listening to, to the show right now, there are, I, it, it's like if you're playing Super Mario Brothers and you're, you're playing a video game, you get those little power ups, those little gold coins as you walk through the day. They're invisible. We don't know what they are. And they're different for different kinds of biology. But if you know what they are, it's like just free energy sitting around for you to harvest, but only if you know. And, and so we're, we're reaching the stage of knowing mm. this invisible map so we can navigate ourselves mm. better. But there is a dark side to this and something I wanted to ask about. Uh, I have been, even in, my, in 2011, I was writing about the dangers of electromagnetic mm. frequencies. Mm. And the industry has always said, look, it's about a heating effect and there's not enough heat mm. going on. But we've all known it's a mitochondrial mm. effect. Yes. And recently, the, the, the research has come out, there's something called a voltage-gated calcium mm. channel. And I interviewed Dr. Mercola yeah. about this recently. Yeah. And this part of our cell membrane is seven million times more sensitive to electromagnetic frequencies. Mm. So without any heating effect, even something as simple as Bluetooth mm. or a Wi-Fi mm. or your, your cell phone can cause a calcium channel to open up. Some calcium rushes into the cell, which causes inflammation mm. and mitochondrial dysfunction when you get too much mm. calcium. So now, one reason I'm willing to to wear the Aura Ring is that you can put it in airplane mode most of mm. the time, so it doesn't have any meaningful EMFs. Mm. Uh, and then when you are going to get the data off of it, you're getting a brief burst of Bluetooth, and then you're done. Mm. Uh, what's uh, what's your take? I mean, a lot of times, in fact, uh, Dr. McCullough was, was like, look, sometimes my ring goes out of airplane mode and just into active mode when I don't want it to. What's your take on EMF and, and biomonitoring? Like we don't want to break our bodies because we're monitoring them so much. Yes. Like kind of walk me through your thoughts. Yes, yeah, so, so definitely that's that's very important thing that we've taken into account from the very beginning of, of designing the product. That's one of the reasons why we wanted to make it completely standalone device so that it doesn't need your mobile or anything else to, to be able to do all those things that it does. So all the algorithms are running inside the ring itself, and it can store the data for three to four weeks without having connection to the mobile, and still you have all the data. So that was the first thing. And then second... But it can't track the data for three to four weeks yeah, without being powered, right? Yes, it just stores the you, data you just, from a few Yeah, minutes. you just need to uh, charge it, but it con continues okay. to store the, the data and calculate everything so you can you can and you charge it basically every two days yeah. it needs about an hour of charging yes yes or if you if you okay. charge every day it's 15 minutes or so so if you just keep okay. it charged you don't need to connect it to your mobile it, it's continuous storing the data for three to four weeks at least and then you get all the data so that was the first first thing the second is that um, that we wanted to minimize the time that, that the ring is communicating with the mobile. Bluetooth was the only kind of a acceptable way for us to, to do that. And, and we, we minimized the time that there is the communication between, between the ring and the mobile. The, the longest time of that communication is in the morning when you 
when the ring moves the the, the uh, transfers the sleep data to the to the app and for the visualization it takes about 45 seconds or something like that that's the longest time and then the rest of the day if you don't switch it to the airplane mode then every now and then it it uses the advertising mode to check that whether the mobile is is there or not but still and about how frequently is that it's uh if you think about 24 hours it's less than 1% of that time so it's okay it's very very rarely and and, and so compared to wearing a set of bluetooth headphones around your neck that are turned on that you're not talking on it's far less than that yes. or if you use bluetooth headphones for a 10 minute phone call you're especially in your brain it's yes. not a great idea and as, as, uh, but it's it, it's very small compared to that yes and also in the power levels we wanted to minimize that and we use it's it's less than mm -hmm. 1 milliwatt Normally, like like your cell phone, normally the output power is is typically between 1,000 to 2,000 2, milliwatts as peak, and yeah. approximately 120 to 220 240 uh, during the call. So it's huge difference there. And then, so if you're if you're listening to this and you keep your cell phone in your front pocket by your junk, even if you're not on the phone, you're getting tens of thousands of times more EMFs than you would get from an Aura Ring, uh, which is one of the reasons I'm willing to wear it because I don't want to have a constant Bluetooth transmitter when I'm sleeping and, and all day long. Um, but this, this is a, a, one of the situations where I believe that the value of the data you're getting, especially with the Ring in airplane mode, it far exceeds the very low EMF tax. Because if you have Wi-Fi in your house, you're getting more than this anyway. Like it's it's trivially small, but it's not non-existent. Yeah, and then then to your question that sometimes the ring exits exists uh, fr from the or exits from from the uh, airplane mode, and that may happen if the ring is too loose. So if you are wearing the ring in, in and it's it's very loose in your finger, then in some occasion for zero point some percent of our users, it may think that it's it's not in the finger anymore. And then, then it mm. turns, turns on uh, the, the Bluetooth, but still it just turns on this advertising mode. It doesn't, doesn't kind of start sending anything or something. It's just the advertising that checking whether there's mobile available for data transfer. So, so we would recommend anyone that if, if the ring is too loose to wear it in another especially during the night, just wear it on another finger so that it's a little bit, let's say, tight but comfortable there. So then you don't have that problem. So it's 0. Point something percent of the users. But anyhow, we, we have already addressed this. So Dr. Mercola has, has given this message to us and already a few months back, we, we addressed this already in our development and there will be different technical solutions to this so we we may end up uh, developing that kind of settings that you can you can define the time that when the ring wakes up for data transfer yeah. then it's exact then it's then it's kind of sleeping it doesn't activate the connection but because of the right. user experience reason we didn't want to have that there yet but but we will we will have different alternatives there and you're going to run into this problem, and every tech company does this. The the early adopter biohacker crowd, like we want control, mm. uh, and then for an average consumer who is just not going to care about this stuff, mm. the control actually just adds complexity. Mm. It's the difference between running Linux on your laptop and mm. having a Mac. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. The Mac stuff. Well, it used to just kind of work. It sometimes yes. works, sometimes it doesn't. Yes. Now, but. Uh, it, there's always a trade-off there, and, and I would encourage you, and I would encourage every company making these biomonitoring devices, look, make a simple interface, but have, even though it costs more for development, have the interface that allows the power users to do what they want with the yes. device, because we'll, I promise you the power users like Dr. McCullough, like me, and like the many of our listeners, mm. Um, they will provide more value to you than yes. cost for the development. If you just let us like let exactly us, let us be at the cutting edge. Exactly. Uh, so I, I appreciate that you're putting that in there. Thank yes. you. Yes. Yes. All right.
So we've talked about electrical pollution and how you've addressed it from the design. Something else we didn't talk about, and uh, and, and guys, you're listening. Uh, I don't. Uh, we don't have a a business relationship here. Uh, you might have sent me my ring for free. I don't actually know. Uh, I might have bought it too. I don't remember. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is is I'm not selling this at all. I'm just telling you like, okay, this is kind of cool. Uh, the other thing is uh, it's waterproof mm. and at basis especially our prototypes, they weren't waterproof. And even our own engineers would forget and take a shower or they'd sweat on it. And like, ah, like there were 10 of these things and we just lost five of them thanks to showers. <laughs> and, yeah. and I've ruined so many, mm. I have a drawer full mm. of ruined wearable devices. <laughs> like half the companies aren't even in existence anymore. And this is waterproof. Yes. And that actually matters to me because I'm probably, especially when you first wake up and take a shower, you're like, oh, I didn't take my ring off, damn, mm. you know, there goes a few hundred bucks. Uh, by the way, I don't even know how much the rings cost right now, but they're, reasonably affordable what's two, the, what's 299 dollars 299 yes. so yeah in, in terms of biomonitoring it's more expensive than a fitbit mm. or a, a wristband kind of solution but it gives you a lot more data and it's less weight i don't know I, I think it's a superior thing it's and i'll be really straightforward i have never worn any tracker for more than about six weeks they they just get irritating and the value of the data isn't high enough to justify continuously charging and downloading and syncing and all this stuff but this is the first device I've been able to wear for more than six weeks. I'm like, oh, I'm still getting good data. It's not that much work. Mm. Uh, I look forward to charging it less and all that. But the amount of thought and management required is very, very low, which is why I thought I'd have you on the show, just because, hey, I, I think you guys kind of crack the code because you get more valuable data in less work and with less inconvenience. So like the equation is there that I would tell my mom to wear this ring and I wouldn't tell my mom to wear any of the stuff that I've worked with previously. Mm. So I, I think you guys move the needle from a just from a consumer usability perspective and, and that's actually hard to do. So yeah, kudos. yes, that's right, yes. So our retention rates also show that we have really committed user base and we highly respect that because uh, that's the way for us to, to get to know all everyone as, as users and the uniqueness of every, every person. So the longer term data that we get, the, the more we we can learn, the more we can we can customize the algorithms to to bring in more value. Well, I uh, I think you guys are doing something uh, pretty special here, and I uh, I appreciate it. Now, we're coming up on the end of the show, and in now more than four hundred episodes, I've asked you know a whole bunch of uh, inventors and scientists and authors and researchers and all the the same question uh, because I I'm also gathering data. And 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 the question is, if someone came to you tomorrow and they said, Petri, I want to perform better at everything I do as a human being, you know, not just my work, not just sports, but just being a human, what are the three most important pieces of advice you'd have for me? What would you tell them? I would say the first one is have your sleep patterns or sleep efficiency uh, fixed so that you know how you get the best quality, best quality sleep and what's what's good for you and what's not in relation to sleep. So, uh, so sleep better. Yeah, exactly. So sleep and recovery are, are our passion. So we want to provide meaningful, value, valuable information for people about that. All right, so now this is your personal answer. It can include your, your life's work and all that, which it, it usually does, but all right, you got two more. <laughs> what, what are the other two things that are most important? Um, I think, yeah, follow, follow your inspiration in your life. So I think that's, that's really good, good driver for doing whatever you want to do. So and what, what do you want to realize in your life? Whatever you do, follow your inspiration and uh, kind of find your way to serve others as well. But also, uh, also service. Yeah, service. yes, and, and kind of a. Um, I would also say that, that value your close people uh, because they they are the most important people in your life. Like we have two daughters and. And my, my precious wife, we've been together for more than 30 years now. 
Uh, so, so the the older you get, the more the more you value those close people around you, your own family, your your parents, and everything you you, you can learn from them. They are kind of best reflectors of yourself to understand, become more aware of yourself. Beautiful. Well, Patry, thank you for being on Bulletproof Radio. And where can people find out more about the Aura Ring? By the way, it's O-U-R-A is how you spell yes. Aura. But uh, is, what's the URL people should go to to just check it out? Yeah, AuraRing.com. There you can find some more information. That's O-U-R-A Ring.com. Yes. Awesome. All right. If you enjoyed today's episode, uh, you know what to do. Do something to make yourself more self-aware. And you may decide you want to incorporate some tracking tech. I've been doing it, geez, for like 20 years now. And it's, it's made a huge difference just in me understanding when is my biology doing what I want it to do, when is it not. And whether or not you, you choose this piece of technology or, or something else, or just to wake up and say, how am I doing right now? <laughs> uh, things like that are, are so profoundly important to, uh, to just, doing what, uh, just doing what you're here to do. And just not wasting that that precious gift that is uh, you know that is your life here, and I I've had so much change in my life by just knowing what's going on in there that I couldn't see and making it visible. And this is one of those many uh, many pieces of technology, in addition to the practices of meditation and awareness and all the other things you can do. So if this is valuable for you, great. And I'd encourage you to share it with someone. And you could also go to uh, the iTunes thing, go to bulletproof.com slash iTunes and we'll give you the link to the thing and just leave a quick review on the show that says, hey, you know, this is a show that's worth listening to and that helps other people find Bulletproof Radio, which is really useful. And I would personally be profoundly grateful if you've read Headstrong or The Bulletproof Diet, if you took another few seconds to head to Amazon and leave a review and just say, uh, you know, just say what you think about the book. It really makes a difference. And I actually see all the reviews on Amazon and things like that. So that's one way I, I put thousands and thousands of hours into writing these things or into, into producing Bulletproof Radio. And if it's a good use of my time to, to consolidate all that knowledge for you and to find people who are changing the world and have these conversations, it's a simple thing to do to say thanks. And it's something that I really notice. So I appreciate it if you do that. Have an awesome day and I'll see you on the next episode. Yeah.